look at the defensive aspect of this because you can still defeat the devil by resisting him. Scripture says that resist, or it says draw near to God or surrender to God, and resist the devil and he will flee from you. So again, we must understand that whatever stance we take, we are victorious. Now there are times where you have to go in and exercise your authority, which is what we've been listening to and, 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 and what we've been applying. I know in the home groups you've been asking people, you know, how often did you use the name of Jesus? Um, and did you get results? Look, I must encourage you, the more you do it, the better it gets. Because it's got to be part of you. You can't fake it. Remember the guys that faked it with the name of Jesus and the demons came and stripped them naked and beat them up? You know, they, they, they discern whether you actually know and believe what you're saying. So the more you do it, the more you meditate on it, the better it gets. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. That's why I don't want you to be apprehensive. I want you to use it boldly and you get the results. So turn with me to Ephesians chapter 6, and let's read from verse 10 together. Hallelujah. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Finally, brethren, be strong in yourself. Be strong in the Lord. I'll just start again. Are you reading from the book of Demetria or are you reading from the book of Ephesians? Um, it says, be strong in the Lord and in the power of His might. There are two really significant words there, power and might. We very seldom use them together in the English language, but because in the Greek um, they have a very distinct meaning. You see, the, the power is the dynami, it's, it's the, the exercising power that you need, but then might is, is, is a place of authority. So, it says clearly, my brethren, be strong Almighty in the Lord and in the power of His might. And then it tells us to do something. There's an action here. The action is this. Put on. It doesn't fall on you. You have to put it on. You don't have it already. Hello? Otherwise, it wouldn't say put on. But it says put on the whole armor of God. Not one piece or two pieces, but the whole armor of God that you may stand against or the vials, the schemes of the devil. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood. The Greek word for wrestle is an interesting one because it implies that you take the strain, you're, you know, you're, you're moving and flowing with the opposition, this thing that is opposing you. That's what wrestling is. So you've been quite flexible in this thing, but you're not moving. See, very brittle, very rigid things break. But if you're able to wrestle with something, you don't break. You just keep standing. Amen? Amen. So glad a few of you are listening to me today. So, for we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against the principalities, the powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this age, against spiritual hosts of wickedness in the heavenly places. Now, it names all these frightening things because it is a spiritual battle. Therefore, now it tells you why you've got to put it all on. It says, therefore, 
take up. So put on action. Take up action, which implies that we take it off. You know, there are times in your life where you can take off your armor and go into the stream and just chill. Hello? You've been in battle so long. God does not want you to walk around in battle armor all the time. However, when the devil is throwing things at you, when you're under attack, when you're in the spiritual conflict, then you better put it on. So it says, put it on, then it says, take up. Again, the whole armor of God, making a point that you may be able to withstand. Interesting word, withstand. It, say, it implies to come face to face and contend, contend with, resist, vigorously resist. So, to withstand is to eyeball him. Hello? You eyeball him. You resist him. You don't... You check him out. Say, I'm not moving. I've got my armor on. Give it, give it your best shot. Because you don't have anything. Hello? Praise God. So it says, take up the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand in the evil day and having done all to stand. That little phrase has taught me so much in the last few years because you get to a place where you think, I've done all, Lord. Man, you know, I put, I've done it everything I can do. And he says, no, you haven't. Because... You think you've done all, but there's still something more you can do. Having done all, to stand. And you've got to keep standing. And you've got to keep doing. And then verse 14, stand therefore. Withstand, stand. I mean, stand against. It's all about positioning. Eyeballing, face to face. Resisting, wrestling. It's all about positioning. Most of us never position ourselves for victory. You know, if your knees are bent and you turn around, that's not victorious. If you're terrified and you've got your hands up, if you've got your back to it, it's not positioning yourself for victory. Positioning yourself for victory is standing. Is standing. Is standing. So I want you to see that in the Spirit. That's who you are. You are more than a conqueror. Stand therefore, having girded your waist with truth, and now we start to go through these six pieces or six elements of the armor. Having girded your waist with truth, having put on the breastplate of righteousness, having shod your feet with the preparation of the gospel of peace, above all, taking the shield of faith with which you will be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked one. And take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God, praying always with all prayers and supplication in the Spirit, being watchful to this end, with all perseverance and supplication for all the saints. This isn't just for you. You know, you're part of an army a battalion. You know, this church is just a battalion of, of, of the, the great army of God. But we've got to do it together. It's for all of us. Yeah. Yeah. Amen. One shield drops. There should be someone there to 
lift that person up, get his shield back up. Hallelujah. Now, I want to point out that prayer is not a weapon or even part of the armor. It is the means by which we engage in the battle itself and the purpose for which we are armed. So once we've done all, and once we've put it on, once we've taken our stand, prayer is the way we enforce the defeat. Hallelujah. So I'm not going to focus on prayer, because prayer is something entirely different. Prayer is you communing with God, it says, in the Spirit. So you could be praying in the Spirit in your heavenly language once you've taken the stance and know that the devil is being defeated or his defeat is being enforced. Hallelujah. Right. What we want to do now is... Well, let's go through these, these elements. And just before we do that, if you studied armor in um, you know, Old and New Testament, you probably get a little discouraged because you're going to see that um, some people, even like Goliath, put his armor on and then you know, this little dude came along, you know, little shepherd, and with a sling and a, and a stone was able to get him right there. Um, we also see, see Ahab that, uh, uh, you know, uh, an arrow that it wasn't even intended to kill him actually got him in there and he died. So you think, well, why should I put on armor if, I'm, if armor is so vulnerable? But I want you to realize that this is not your armor. It's put, put on the whole armor of God. <laughs> Hallelujah. It's not yours. In um, uh, one, 2 Corinthians 10 verse 4, it says, For we don't walk in the flesh, we do not war after the flesh. For the weapons of our welfare are not carnal, but mighty through God for the pulling down of strongholds. You know, this is a spiritual battle. We have spiritual weapons. We also have spiritual armor. It says, put on... Christ, you know, this is His armor that we're putting on. That's why there's no fault or defect. There's no way a stray, um, uh, a stray arrow from the, the devil can penetrate it. This is perfect. Hallelujah. So when you put on your armor, there's no way. Tell you what happened to Goliath. He, he was a little sort of cocky, after he saw who he was about to fight, he lifted his helmet. Because, you know, that helmet always has that bit that comes down. So he must have lifted it and thought, <laughs> guess where it got him? You know, there's some Christians that just do silly things. And they wonder why the devil... That's why it says, put on the whole armor of God. Right. First one, belt of truth. Can we see it? Now, it's interesting. I don't know if you can see that. That's one of those belts. Have you noticed that um, there are sort of steel tassels there which sort of cover your vital parts? Um, the, there are t two reasons for that. One is that in that culture, it believed that, that things came from the pit of your stomach, you know, passion, emotion. Without. So there is something inside you that needs to be protected. Of course, that's where truth comes into it. So that's protecting that area, that, that, that pit of your stomach where, where those emotions, those feelings, that, that passion comes from. <coughs> but also, on that belt is where you slide the sheath for your dagger and your, and your uh, sword. So without truth, 
guess what? You can't use the Word of God. So you have to have truth. And truth has to surround you. When the Apostle Paul describes the armor of God, he's talking about more than a simple set of help, helpful items. He's talking about the impregnable defenses of the Almighty God. These are keys to withstanding the attacks and onslaughts of the devil. They are ultimate and infinitely powerful tools available to us. Yet Paul chooses to begin describing the set of armor by taking, talking about a belt. Why have all things a belt? He could have started with the mighty sword of the Spirit or the towering shield of faith, the shining breastplate of righteousness, anything but a simple belt. But Paul didn't, and that begs the question, why? The belt played a crucial role in the effectiveness of a soldier's armor. It was the belt that held the sheath without which there was no place to put a sword. Imagine an you know, overzealous soldier that's running into battle and going, oops, don't have my sword. As I said, it, those uh, hung strips of leather and, and, and pieces of steel were there to protect the lower body around the groin. And this area is an easy target for the enemy when in close combat. The Matthew Henry commentary says that the belt girds on or secures all the other pieces of armor. Now, I, I sort of looked at some of the photographs of uh, Roman soldiers, and, and you know, on top of the breastplate, on top of everything that he has on, because under the breastplate is a rope, you have the belt, and the belt is pulled tight to hold it all in. Truth should be attached to us as a belt is attached to a soldier's body. The spiritual significance is that God does not simply want us to point at the truth. He wants us to wear it and have it wrapped around us in all time. Remember, not only does the belt hold everything in place, it also serves to carry the sheath that holds the sword of the Spirit. And we need to be ready for action. Some people have the sword of God's Word, but without the belt of truth, they come to reckless conclusions and give the devil room to deceive them. As a result, their lives are full of confusion and defeat. No point in having the belt of, of truth without the sword of the Spirit. There's no point in have, with having the sword of the Spirit without the belt of truth. The two are vital to your success. Amen. Amen. Breastplate of righteousness. Now, it's interesting that if you look at this, and this is probably the most common one, you know, they had more grand ones than that, but this was a soldier's one. And can you see it's almost like fish scales. And they had that. Under it was a solid piece, but then they would put leather and other bits, sometimes hundreds of little bits of things in there to protect the body. But it also got very hot. So in order to, to help with all these sharp bits that were there, they would put a robe underneath. And I want you to see, as with the, um, uh, the belt and the sword of the Spirit, the, the robe and the breastplate are, again, very important to see as working together. The breastplate was an important item of defense that protected the front torso and all the vital organs. It was often composed of a solid uh, piece of metal, but it was also contained numerous small pieces that were sewn uh, to cloth or leather, then overlapped like the scales of a fish. These scales could number as many as 700 or even 1,000. But when the sun shone directly on the armor, it could become very hot. 
So to avoid being burnt or even pinched by the moving metals, metal plates, the soldiers always wore a sturdy robe under the armor. In other words, the breastplate of righteousness should always be worn together with the robe of Jesus' righteousness. I put on righteousness and it clothed me. The robe of Jesus is next to the skin and covers most of the body. Also keep in mind that the high priest wore a golden breastplate over his robe. And that represented the nearness of heart to God. In Exodus 28, verse 29, it says, And Aaron shall bear the names of the children of Israel in the breastplate of judgment upon his heart. The only way we can experience victory in battle against the forces of darkness is through confidence that the righteousness of Jesus covers our hearts. So we're forgiven. You will not defeat the devil if you live under condemnation. You've got to live in liberty and freedom. Another interesting aspect of the breastplate was that it offered no protection to a person's back. Yeah, it was taken for granted that soldiers would not flee. So they covered the front. I think I should speak a lot to us as well. We're not intended. It, it says stand keep standing, you know, it, it talks about uh, withstanding, as I said, eyeballing. It's all about a confidence that we have. And of course, the, the breastplate of righteousness gives us that confidence. Why? Because the devil cannot accuse you of anything if you've got your breastplate of righteousness on. And if you've got the robe of Jesus Christ underneath it, covering your heart, Man, you're standing in exactly the same place Jesus did. And the reason why the devil could not defeat Jesus is because Jesus was without sin. He was as righteous as, as God himself because he was God himself, made flesh. Well, we share in the very same righteousness. As soldiers, we should stand firm and never surrender any ground to the devil. Why? Because we are righteous. God's got our back covered. Hallelujah. That's why he says, keep standing, keep standing, keep resisting the enemy. Right, let's move on to the shield of faith. Now, again, that's a, a, a Roman shield, and it's, it's quite tall. You know, you, it, it covers, you can, you can hide behind it. And... Um, you know, when arrows are, or, or, you know, large amount of arrows are, are shot in your direction, you, and what they do is they just, they almost lock their shields together and they tilt so that they can get underneath. Nothing can penetrate it. The warrior's shield was his first line of defense, usually made of wood or bronze. It was often big enough to protect the whole body when the soldier crouched down under a hail of arrows. Likewise, faith in Christ's blood is our first defense against the great accuser. The enemy is constantly firing a volley of flaming arrows at us. What are they? They, they lies, they condemnation, they temptation, all the things that he can try and overpower you with. The purpose of the shield of faith is to deflect the fiery darts of the enemy and prevent them from ever making contact. Multitudes of Christians fail on the battlefield and fail to overcome evil because they wait until they are immersed in the fires of accusation, temptation, and lies before making the effort to resist. At that point, it's often too late. Once you recognize a fiery dart sailing towards you, there is no time to lose. Once you recognize a fiery dart sailing towards you, act. Hold up the shield of faith and do everything in your power to keep as much distance as possible between you and anything the devil is firing your way. If we yield without a fight, we are in reality inviting defeat. 
rather than enforcing it. Another thing to note is that this um, shield was not held loosely in a soldier's hands. It wasn't sort of... It was a very deliberate, very firm action. Well, that's how our faith should be. It shouldn't be loose and haphazard because that's how the fiery darts penetrate us. Can't have flimsy faith while the battle is raging. The shields of old were often of distinctive nature. Sometimes they marked the insignia or the name of the emperor so that soldiers could avoid fighting their own comrades in confusion. Uh, this instant, you can see, is a distinct pattern on there. <coughs> Only that battalion of that army would have that. So you're not going to start fighting, because can you imagine, sometimes there's tens of thousands of people all just, you know, at it in battle. You can turn around and mistake one of your own, well, you can't because the first thing you look at is the shield. The devil can't deceive you. And when your shield of faith is up, you know that you're a winner. In the same way the devil sends his flaming arrows, we are to hold up the shield bearing the name of our Lord and our King, the King of Kings, Jesus Christ. Another thing is that these, these um, sh shields were made of wood and, and covered with leather. Um, you can't see it there, but that, that, that front bit, except for the steel bit in the middle, it's, it's wood and then it's leather, and that, that is a sort, of, sort of painted thing. All right, you do get the bronze ones, but they're normally the small ones that the hierarchy have. But the, the foot soldier... Um, wouldn't have them. And what they used to do is soak their shields before battle in water so that when the fiery darts hit, they were extinguished. Well, do you know, we have the water of God's Word. Amen. So we can soak our shield of faith in, in God's Word and know that anything that the devil fires at us will be extinguished. Ephesians 5, verse 26, if you want to reference. Right, let's move on. The helmet of salvation. As I said, there are various Bible stories where um, you see the helmet did not protect anyone. And uh, it's so easy to sit back and think, well... You know, if it's not going to protect me, well, why should I wear it? Well, if you're saved, you have to wear it. That's what it is. It's the helmet of salvation. And it's not just to protect the stones from hitting your head. It's also to protect what's inside your head. So the helmet of salvation isn't just to protect the, the, those stones thoughts that the devil's trying to put into your head. It's also to protect the thoughts that you have in your head. So you have to use it, wear it, to protect yourself from yourself as well as the enemy. Can you see that? Yeah. Why? Because, again, Jesus secured salvation, and salvation is an ongoing thing. You are saved, and then you are being saved. You need the, the helmet of salvation through your being saved, walking out or working out your salvation. So that's why it's so important to put it on. It, it protects you from all these thoughts and, and all the things that the devil is trying to Put in, because if he can control your mind, he controls your actions. If he controls your actions, he controls your life. And he can build whatever he wants into your life then. But then on the inside, there are things going on that you need to deal with. Put it on your head 
and know that the blood of Jesus that secured that helmet of salvation, it says clearly in the, in, in the word that you can purge your conscience with the blood. Isn't that amazing? It's like whatever you have in your conscious mind that is, that is affecting your life, may it be affecting your actions, may be causing you to sin. Take that conscious thing, dip it in the blood of Jesus as it purges it. Wow. No one's excited about it. Let me tell you, that's a great benefit. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Now, your body has seven sacred openings from the neck up. Two nostrils, two ears, two eyes, and two mouths. Now, and it has one mouth. Now, don't want to get into it, but in ancient culture, East Mediterranean culture, um, they were very concerned with what went into your body and what came out of your body. And the thing that we have most problem with going in and coming out of is the mouth. So, God was wise enough not to give us two mouths. <laughs> we won't really know how pivotal this thing is and how what we say and what we confess has affected our lives and our walk and you know, our ability to overcome until we get to heaven. Because it says that we will be held accountable for every false word that leaves our mouth. Watch that. Especially in battle. Watch that. Now, so many of you, by the confession of your own mouth, let the devil believe that he's winning. You've got to really enforce his defeat through your confession. Right, the gospel or the sandals. Have we got the sandals? Hallelujah. Interesting, these sandals. Um, you notice they've got little things underneath them that actually help you to, to grip. Can you, has anyone been to any Middle Eastern country? Now, look, I, I mean, I, we go to Cyprus, but we, if in places it looks just like, you know, like Israel, where you could imagine Jesus walking there. But I could not in a million years imagine myself walking around with no shoes on, on that terrain. Definitely not full body armor, shield, sword, no shoe. Oh! I mean, can you imagine? You wouldn't be fighting. You'd be going, ow, oh, oh. And so this is vital to us being able to put on the whole armor of God, being able to stand and withstand. As I said, just imagine yourself barefooted in that terrain. The good news is that by considering ourselves Dead to self in Christ. Because that's what the gospel of peace is. How do we make peace with God? We accept Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior. And then we carry the cross. We die to self. And this is a, there's no point us trying to get other people into the kingdom if we don't have peace with God. So this, is again, is part of our salvation, but it's an ongoing peace that we have to have. And I want to encourage you that your sandals never wear out. So how do you know that? Where is that in Scripture? Well, Deuteronomy 29, verse 5. You know, these, the children of Israel wandering around in the wilderness, and guess what? Your sandals have not worn out on your feet. Blessed be the name of the Lord. 
Isaiah 52 verse 7 says, How beautiful upon the mountains are the feet of him who brings good news, who proclaims peace, who brings good tidings, who proclaims salvation. This is the gospel of peace. If you want peace, make sure your sandals are on. Amen? Make sure your sandals are on. You cannot stand and keep standing unless you're at peace. And you have a gospel of peace. In other words, you have the good news that you are in pe- at peace with God. So when you're at peace with God, you don't have to worry about God not defending you. You're not antagonistic toward God. He's not antagonistic toward you. You can be antagonistic toward the enemy because if God be for you, who can be against you? Hallelujah. And finally, the sword of the Spirit. Now, it says in verse 17... um, Take up the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. The Greek word for word is rima. It's not um, logos. So the sword of the Spirit isn't just picking up Scripture and aimlessly going and just reading it out. It's the spoken Word of God that He uses because it's very individual and very personal to you and what you're going through. That's the rima. So, while I'm speaking, you might get a rima. You know, it, it penetrates your heart and you go, that's for me. It can come while you're studying. It can come while you're listening to a CD. It can come while you're praying. But you know that that is a word from God. That's the sword of the Spirit. Otherwise, you can just babble the Word of God. But what the devil never had was truth. So when he, because the the sword of the Spirit is also the sword of truth. When he came to Jesus in the wilderness and accused Jesus and tried to tempt Jesus, Jesus just said, It is written. Now, he was quoting Scripture, but there was no truth in what he was doing. And he never had Rima, because God would not give him Rima. All he had was Logos. And Jesus could counteract whatever the devil said with Rima. Faith come by hearing, and hearing by the Rima of God. Hallelujah. I also want you to realize that because it mentions a sword, a sword has two edges. For the Word of God is quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing piercing even to the dividing asunder of soul and spirit and of joints and marrow, and is a discerner of the thoughts and intent of the heart. Again, the sword is, because it has two edges, is meant to have dual purpose. One is to use it against the enemy. It is written. Rima. The other is to use it against yourself. There are certain things. It says clearly here that the sword is quick and powerful and sharper than it, piercing even through the dividing asunder the soul and the spirit, the joints and power. It's God's word does things inside of you. Jesus said that I have come, again, we'll mention, I did not come to bring peace but a sword. But he didn't come to go to war. He came to divide the soul and the spirit to make us discerning about spiritual matters. The Word of God does that. Otherwise, you get confused and deceived, and the devil can say anything and do anything, and you just uh, won't know how to handle it or how to respond. So we've got the sword of the Spirit. This is the only offensive weapon in the armory. But why is it put in 
when it's offensive and all the other things are defensive. Because it has dual purpose. The edges of the uh, Spirit's sword is to be used against the enemy and also for personal use. We must be ready to apply the sword to ourselves. So remember, the Word of God is a practical tool for everyday living as well as fighting the devil. A soldier traveling in enemy territory never left his sword out of reach. It is always kept close by. In ancient times, there was no stainless steel, so the sword became rusty and dull. Swords were kept clean by frequent use and by honing them against the stone, which is, our, in our case, the rock of ages, Jesus Christ, or another soldier's sword. Iron sharpens iron, Proverbs 27, verse 11. Our skill in the Word is sharpened the very same way. The Word of God never, ever returns void. Therefore, it can never fail against the enemy. Why? Because it says that God watches over His Word to perform it. So when you're in battle and you speak out the Word, the rima, guess what? God says, I got it. That's why the battle is the Lord's. Amen. Now we're going to end with this. God has paid the bill for the entire arsenal. Part of the arsenal that we have against the enemy is the armor that it says, put on, take up. Now a lot of Christians are walking around naked in the Spirit because they've not put on the armor of God. They've not put on Christ. And I th encourage you, the first thing you do in the morning is check it out. Amen? Amen. Even if you have to put a little, you know, where's the guy? That guy. You know, just to remind you that that's what you should be looking like. Fierce! Remind the devil that you're ready for battle. Amen? He'll just go and hustle someone else. But who cares? You know, you are there to enforce his defeat. So, all that we need was purchased at Calvary by the blood of Jesus Christ. And just as Jonathan so loved David that he gave him his armor, his sword, his robe, and indeed his very throne, 1 Samuel 18, verse 34. So Jesus has given us all we need for the spiritual battle. You have nothing else that you require to be victorious. This message today is called Dressed for Victory. That's who you are. You are dressed for victory. Hallelujah. Act like it. Stand like it. You're not dressed for failure. He paid the price. He said, look, I'll give you all that I have. When it says that we are clothed in Christ, this is what it means. Why? Because there is a war raging. Whether you like it or not, there's conflict. And that conflict, that spiritual battle, rages and will continue to rage. But the good news is that we always win. No matter what stance we take, we always win. So this week, check out your armor. It says put on the full armor of God. Make sure all six items. And then start to pray in the Spirit. Hallelujah. I promise you victory. This week, you'll have more breakthroughs. I mean, the last couple of weeks have been phenomenal. We changed the spiritual climate. And people, I mean, I'm, I'm getting lots of messages from people that have, you know, watched it on YouTube and especially give it back second. Um, but I, I really encourage you because this, you know, the series of, of teachings on how to deal with the devil is your way to victory. Amen? And I love the way this passage ends where it says that 
praying always with all prayers and supplications in the Spirit, being watchful to this end with all perseverance and supplication for all the saints. We're doing it for each other. Hallelujah. So if one of us fails to put on his helmet of salvation and gets all those weird things happening in his head, guess what? It affects the person next to them. So make sure that we, as a, as a fighting unit, are in unity. Amen. Amen. Watch your conversation, but use the sword of the Spirit. And the shield, that's a mighty shield of faith. Have it up. And you know what? You don't have to hold it up all the time and get tired. You can rest it and get behind it. The devil still cannot penetrate. Hallelujah. Stand, keep standing. I want to hear testimonies. I want to get, I want to hear the victories that you, because yeah, they're filtering through, but I know there are a lot more. Amen. Amen. The more we testify, the greater the response is from others, because without that testimony, we can't build each other up. So bring them in, let's share them. I said, the name of Jesus, that really did penetrate. People got so confident in being able to stand and say, Jesus! Oh, in the name of Jesus, I command you, Satan. How do we enforce his defeat? Well, we, we take him on. <laughs> Amen? Amen? And we take him on and we, we recognize that that is a work of the devil, it's, it, it's been done by someone that he, or some institution or something that he has influence and control over. But it's still the devil. Amen. Amen. So we destroy that. How do you destroy it? Satan, I serve notice on you right now. You let go. I curse every plan and maneuver of yours. You are unable to use this situation to your advantage. I go forth right now and declare that Jesus Christ is Lord of that situation. So in the name of Jesus, let go of it right now. Cease to operate. It is nullified and void, and you have no power and authority. And I exercise the authority that I have in the name of Jesus, and I enforce your defeat. And those people that you're using, I claim them for the kingdom of God. I set them free. I deliver them right now in the name of Jesus. And I declare that they are in the kingdom of light, and the kingdom of darkness has no access to them anymore in Jesus' name, in Jesus' name, and it is done in Jesus' name. <laughs> Hallelujah. Then what do I do? Stand. Hallelujah. Because it says with all perseverance. Let me tell you, you might not see it. It's happened in the Spirit. And this, I, I want you to understand this. 12 o'clock right on time. Uh, I want you to understand this, that because you can't see it doesn't mean it hasn't happened. The one thing about the spirit realm, it, is, it has no past, it has no future, it has a present. And when you say, it is done, it's done. The devil sees it. So in the spirit realm, it's done. Now, his weapon... And his strategy is to deceive you to say it isn't. Because the only way he can gain that territory back is if you give it to him. That's why you have to stand. That's why you have to stand. So many of us, we standing and we're going, five minutes and it's not happened. No. I don't care how long it takes. It will manifest. It will come from the spirit realm into the natural realm. Why? Because that is the truth. That is reality, not this. We have to wait. We have to keep standing. We've got to make sure we have the full armor of God on. And that way, we're not deceived. You know, those fiery dots do not penetrate. We don't get a you know, pebble in the forehead. We are victorious. Amen. 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 Hallelujah. 
We trust you enjoyed this program. For more information on Life Matters and Cornerstone Church, visit our website at www.cornerstonechurch.com. We hold our Sunday services at 10.30 a.m. and 6 p.m. at Sandown Park, Isha, Surrey. We are a family church where all are welcome.